Jesus' resurrection is the most talked about event in the history of the world. And that's especially true at this time of year. You'd imagine that the most talked about event in the world would also be the best understood, but that's not necessarily the case. Unfortunately, the cross and the empty tomb are commonly depicted as evidences of divine justice and judgment. It's taught that Jesus was punished in our place for our sins on the cross. That is not, however, how Paul viewed the cross. And we look then in the middle of his letter to the Corinthians, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll start in the end and we'll work our way through, halfway through uh, chapter 6. It's what it says, therefore, Paul writes, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul identifies himself as an ambassador of Christ. An ambassador is somebody who doesn't act on his own authority. What he does, he understands the message of the dignitary that is dispatching him, and what an ambassador does is reflects the will of the one who sent him to those that the ambassador wants to communicate with. That's the way Paul saw himself. He didn't see his role as to say what made sense to him. He, his role was to say what made sense to the one who sent him, and Paul believed that God sent him to bring a message to us about Jesus Christ and why he died and what that means for us. Paul believed he was a divinely commissioned ambassador. And there's some similarities and there's some differences between human ambassadors and divine ambassadors. Um, one of the things that they have in common is it, ambassadors at that time uh, were usually sent to establish or renew friendly relations or to make an alliance. And so why a powerful country would send an ambassador is they wanted to bring good news to a country or a people that they wanted to establish a communication pipeline to, and that's why you'd send an ambassador. You don't send an ambassador to a country you're at war with. You send your army. But if you want to restore or establish friendly relationships, that's why you send an ambassador. A lot of times when countries go to war, the ambassador from the country will be recalled. You don't want to put the ambassador in harm's way. Uh, God's purpose then in sending ambassadors is similar. Um, to put an end to hostilities and to bring about reconciliation. We talked about that, the message of the cross. If you were to identify the message of the cross and describe it, how would you describe it? What is the message of the cross? And we've talked about it. It's a good question though, isn't it? We talk about the cross and what is the message of the cross? How would you describe it? How would you define it in one word? Try that. One word. What's the message of the cross? Fortunately, the Bible fills in the blank. Paul fills in the blank, calls the message of the cross. Let's see if I can get this. Look what it says. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of, and it puts it in one word, reconciliation. The message of the cross, then, is the message of reconciliation. Um, again, what is reconciliation? And there is, it says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. We break this down. I won't go as deep into it, but I, this is a really good verse. And if you wanted to understand the message of the cross, I don't think there's a better description. I don't think so. What is the message of the cross? God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. That's the message of the cross. You could remember that, couldn't you? 
It, the message of the cross, it's about God, and what God was doing. What was God doing? What was God doing at the cross? God was reconciling. Reconciling is when you substitute a relationship of hostility to one of peace and goodwill. Say, you've done something to me, I resent it. And so it puts us on the outs. Let's say after a period of time, I determine, ah, you know what? I want to let this go. I don't want what you did to me to stand in the way of a relationship. So I would choose as the offended one to reconcile our relationship. And what I would do then is kind of give you a a sense for what I wanted to do. I might send an individual, I might send a letter, and then, let's say if I sent a letter, and we talk about that, if I sent a letter and I gave it to you, I have already done everything because I've already put our differences to the side. And if I give you that letter, we talked about this, and you never read it, are we reconciled? See, that's the great thing about reconciliation. It really describes what happens from a divine perspective. God has given to us, communicated to us, the message of reconciliation. Does that mean everyone on the, in the, on the planet is reconciled to him? But that's who he reconciled himself to. God was reconciling so the world is reconciled to him. See, the deal with reconciliation is if you don't understand it or believe it, you're not reconciled. See, that's the role. So reconciliation, the real critical thing, comes from the one doing the work. And your role is to believe it. The world can't believe they're reconciled to Christ if they don't hear that God reconciled them to himself. Would you agree? That's why reconciliation is a great word. God does everything, but there is something we need to do, which is to believe it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Believe it. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. That's the message of the cross. The message of the cross is the message of reconciliation. Okay, let's do it. God, what was God doing? God was reconciling. Who was God reconciling? God was reconciling. Who was God reconciling the world to? God was reconciling the world. And how did he do that? God was reconciling the world to himself. And what does that mean? God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ. Not counting men's sins against them. That's the message of reconciliation. Um, and that's what ends up happening with an ambassador. An ambassador brings good news. And certainly, that is really good news. That's really good news. And that's the message of the cross. The message of reconciliation. There's some differences, though, between a humanly commissioned and divinely commissioned ambassador. Um, usually what happened with diplomacy and stuff like that, lesser political powers sent their ambassadors oftentimes to greater, more powerful political powers. And uh, that happened, especially if you wanted to appeal to the greater power. Uh, Roman empires Roman emperors often received ambassadors from subject lands, asking them to do this or kind of don't require so much from us or this, that, or the other. Yet, the all-powerful God, he sent the ambassadors. He sent the ambassadors. And, and as well, ambassadors, it was kind of a, kind of a, not an unspoken law, but one that, countries, they observed that if you sent an ambassador to another country, even if they wanted to be at war with you, they would let the ambassador speak his peace and let him go his way. To abuse an ambassador was an act of war. And if you abused the ambassador, you were automatically 
because it was assumed that you, even if you disagree with the ambassador and hate the country he comes from, you let him say his piece and you let him go his way. Um, Paul is God's ambassador, and he is an ambassador in chains. He is mistreated and beaten and dishonored. And what he continues to do, though, is to proclaim the message which God gave him to proclaim, which is the, what is the message? The message of, now you know that, don't you? What is the cross about? What is the cross about? What's the message of the cross? Message of the cross, one word, the message of reconciliation. That's the word Paul used. And the reason why, I think I talked, I've said this before, the reason why reconciliation was never applied to God, and it's such a great word, is that it was often used between people, but they didn't believe at that time that God was relational enough to apply it to him. God was not interested in relationship. That's the way most people viewed him. And therefore, reconciliation wouldn't really apply to him. But Paul understood, yes, it does. It does apply to him. That's why he sent his son. You might ask, and this is a question that comes up. We know that God has a will. He has a sense for how he wants people to act. And we know that we and people in this planet violate his standards, break his commandments. Um, how could God offer peace to sinful people? It's a good question, isn't it? How could God offer peace to sinful people? It would seem that if God extends his love to us, he has to retract his justice. Would you agree? If he's going to forgive our sins, how could he do that and not violate his sense of justice? Um, Paul helps us to understand how God saved us without sacrificing his justice. Uh, I'm going to try to get to the next. Here we go. One more. One more, John. That's the one. Back one. Thank you. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, notice that God made Jesus to be sin. Once you remember that. He didn't make him to be a sinner. He made him to be sin. Do you agree? That's a difference. If he made him to be a sinner, it would be one thing. But he made him to be sin. That's a different thing. You say, what do you mean, Mike? Let's talk about it. Um, if he made him to be a sinner, then Jesus would be our substitute, right? And that's the way oftentimes many see, and again, it's, it's common to see that Jesus was punished in our place. And you might say, yeah, Mike, that's why he came. And I don't think that's what Paul is pointing. In fact, that's not what Paul is pointing out here. He's not saying Jesus was a sinner. If he did, and if he was saying Christ was a substitute, it would say Jesus was made to be not sin, but he was made to be a, but it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say Jesus was made to be a sinner. It says Jesus was made to be sin. It's a different deal. If he was made to be a sinner, we understand that. So we sin, and if Jesus was made to be a sinner, the wages of sin is death. And then if Jesus was sent to be a sinner and our substitute, God would kill Jesus in our place, right? Right? And that's the way it's commonly understood what happens at the cross. He's our substitute. He's, we should have been killed. He stepped in and took the bullet from God. He took the punishment from God. And if we believe that Jesus is God and accept his punishment as our punishment, that is the way it's seen that you become a Christian. Um, but it doesn't say that 
he made him to be a sinner. He made him to be sin. You know what that is? That's not substitution. That's representation. That's a different thing. Jesus as a substitute and Jesus as a representative, that's a different deal. And Jesus isn't our representative. Jesus is sin's representative. So what it says, Jesus represents sin. What does that mean? Look what it says in Galatians 3. You say, Mike, I don't get this. This is kind of confusing. But we, kind of, we want to be clear about this. We want to understand what Jesus did. It says in Galatians, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Um, try to fight, try to understand what this says. The old covenant places being accepted by God on the far side of doing the commandments. That's what Galatians 3.10 says. Um, All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So if you are going to be accepted by God, By relying on the works of law, the only thing you have to do is to do them perfectly. That's it. Never kill. Um, I'm okay, Mike. I've never killed anybody, so good so far. Being angry at someone is murder. Okay. But, Mike, I've never committed adultery. (laughs) Lust is adultery. You know what the Tenth Commandment is? Tenth Commandment? You can't covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's life. See, the law prescribes not only how we are to act, but how we are to think. And if you are going to be accepted by God based on your compliance to the commandments. All you have to do is never break them once, including coveting. How many of you are going to be accepted by God because you've perfectly complied with the commandment? Come on, raise your hands. Let's see them. Raise your hand. Come on, let's get those going. Don't be shy. Come on. Some of you have walked on. Come on. Of course not. Of course not. And you say, well, certainly God grades on a curve, Mike. (laughs) I mean, I am... (laughs) I wasn't, I was pointing to Brett. (laughs) And that's what we do. We kind of... We kind of believe that kind of God, God doesn't grade on the scale. It's pass fail. If you're going to accept it by Him based on your compliance to the commandments, it's pass fail, and we've failed. Um, all who rely on the works of law are, are under a curse. The Ten Commandments, people say, are helpful suggestions to keep. Uh, people say this all the time on Sunday mornings. The Ten Commandments are God enacting kind of decrees to keep humanity from killing itself. No. They are binding obligations that must be perfectly observed and rigorously enforced. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. We're cursed because we're lawbreakers. Jesus was cursed. Did he ever break a law? He never did. But he was cursed because there's a technicality. 
Here's what it says in the law. Cursed is everyone who is guilty of a capital offense and hung on a tree. Was Jesus guilty under law of a capital offense? He claimed to be God. That's blasphemy. And he was hung on a tree. That's how he died. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So you know what that represents. So we kind of look at that. You know, that's a tree. That's one way to describe the cross. It's a tree. Jesus hung on a tree like that, and he was cursed under the law. Again, it's a technicality, but it applied. Jesus went to the cross accursed under law. What do you think? Is an accursed person going to be accepted by God? Good. Some of you, some of you are shaking your head up and down because it's Jesus. Because it's Jesus. But how about people like you and me? Ours wasn't a technicality. We have violated the commandments. Good news is. He was one of us in that he went to the law accursed. We are accursed because we've done things wrong. He was accursed because of a technicality, but he was accursed. So you know what it's like? It's like in a courtroom. If somebody is charged with the same offense that you've committed, and you're in the gallery, and you're waiting to see what he does with this guy, how is the judge going to judge him? And if you're guilty of the same offense, would you agree? You're really going to listen carefully when the judge hands down the sentence. If you did the same thing, and if you're guilty by the same charge, you are going to tune in. Jesus was a curse under law. What did God find? Guilty or not guilty? Jesus represents sin. You know what it means? It's, the Bible indicates everyone who sins breaks the law because sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Is God going to condemn some who is lawless? It's a good question, isn't it? How about a person who believes in Christ? Christ wasn't cursed. Christ became sin. And you know what that, you know what the, the empty cross, you know what the, the, the cross and the empty tomb say? You can be guilty under Mosaic law and God will bring you to be with him. Do you understand that? Jesus represents sin. Jesus represents lawlessness. Do you understand what I'm saying? He, on the basis of a technicality, us because we've done, but we are lawless. Jesus was lawless in that sense. Is God going to condemn forever somebody who is guilty of Mosaic law? And the answer is in Christ, no. Now, how about us? What do we need to do? Well, it says, in him, we become the righteousness of God. So here's the deal. We're guilty. Jesus died. And he was indicating to us as a representative of sin that sin died. And he rose as righteous. And if you are in Christ, that's what happens. That's why baptism is such a good image of what happens when you're a Christian. Because it's like what happens to Jesus happens to you. Christ died, and it's like we die with him. And his death to sin becomes ours. And then he rose, and we are raised with him. Righteous in God's eyes. That's, that's, that's the image. That's what we are that's what we're taught. We're bracing for the coronavirus. Some are taking it more seriously than others. You know, we all kind of are wondering how bad it's going to get and... What's going to happen? Some of us take different approaches. Some of us are a little bit more slack. You know, we'll do this or that. Some of us are much more careful. And there's some of us who probably have been stockpiling hand sanitizer in Purell 
And that's the reason why the rest of us can't get any. And so <laughs> filling swimming pools with it, and there's some probably swimming laps in hand sanitizer. No, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Um, some of us took caution of the wind. Um, imagine if, and we all feel, at some level, we feel a little nervous about it. Do you agree? Some of us more than others feel a little nervous about it. I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder if it's going to hit me. What if you were to hear, whether you take it real seriously or not, the coronavirus died? What would you think about that? The virus died. It's completely dead. It can't infect anyone. Sin died. That thing which threatens us. In Christ, sin died. And some of us are really try to keep it away, and some of us don't care as much as others, but sin died. And you know what that means when you believe that? You say, yeah, Mike, if I believe that, then what would happen if you believed that? What would happen if you believed in reconciliation? God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. He's given us the message of reconciliation. If you believe you were forgiven, we assume we'd sin it up, right? Right? If somebody lays down their life for you, somebody kills somebody that threatens you, you know what's going to happen if you really believe they did that? That's a person you're going to follow. Can I tell you who that person is? It's God and his son, Jesus Christ. God loved us so much that he sent his son so that he could kill sin. And the thing, the thing that's different between the coronavirus and, and sin is that God can kill sin in Christ, but in order for you to be, you've got to put yourself in Christ. So I've talked about this before. If you... Um, I said this before. If I asked you, say you, you appear before God, God says to you, why should I let you into heaven? Imagine that. Imagine it. Why should I let you in? And what, for a much a long time in my life, what I would have said is, well, because I go to church when a lot of people don't. In fact, I go to church during the 40 days during Lent, even when I'm a fourth, fifth, sixth grader. I was, at that time, I was riding my bike to school before everyone, and I was there with 80 and 90 year old people. At least they seem that old. They might be, they might have been in their 60s. Uh, Father, forgive them. I don't know. Uh, so I would say because I, because I go to church, because I, 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 and who am I trusting in for eternal life? Me. I'm trusting in what I do or don't do. That's not going to cut it. The real, what's the answer? Because you. Because you. Because you loved me enough to send your son to kill the infection that could threaten me eternally. In Christ, you killed it. I want what Jesus did to apply to me. Right? I believe that that's what happened, that Jesus died and he killed sin, and I want his death to kill the sin that threatens me. And when you do that, what happens? You become reconciled to God. And you know what he wants you to do? Believe it. Continue to remain in it. Continue to talk about it. Um, Christ representatives, that's what we're supposed to, that's the message that we're supposed to convey. Um, the message of reconciliation. Um, what it says, chapter 6, verse 1, working together with him, Paul goes on, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. 
by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known. As dying, behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. In return, I speak as to children. Widen your hearts also. Paul understood that in, offer, in order to offer life to the world, somebody would need to pay a price. The gift of eternal life is free. We've talked about this before. The gift of eternal life is free. It's a free gift. That's what grace means. But it's postage and handling was costly. Those to and through whom the gift was transmitted to us, Paul and those first Jewish Christians that ended up going into the Roman Empire to be messages of reconciliation, they paid a dear price to bring the good news of the new covenant to us, and that's what Paul is describing when he talks about the list of hardships in verses 3 through 12. When the Bible says, and it says in St. Corinthians, so death is at work in us and life is at work in you, Paul's making a distinction between those who transmitted the message and those who received it. The Gentiles received the message, us, thank God. And life is at work in us. When you receive and believe the message, you have eternal life. That's the way it works. But those who transmitted the message, death was at work in us. Let me tell you, those ones who gave us this message, they were kicked out of their country. They were hated by their countrymen, and they weren't seen as being all that hot in the eyes of the the Gentiles among whom they lived, there's those who cared for them, but it wasn't, they didn't have their best life now. They were jars of clay. And they received this message of reconciliation, were dispatched to be able to give it to us, and they died as they did so. Um, the inconvenience that the Bible talks about when it says they're jars of clay. It's not the inconvenience of being a servant of Christ. We can serve Christ. They were stewards. They were messengers of reconciliation. Um, but you know what happened? And I'm not going to go on and on. But I just want us to understand something. Paul understood that he was living at a unique time in salvation history. And what he understood, and he was trying to encourage these Jewish Christians whom he was trying to strengthen, and, and I'm going to read out of Isaiah, what he understood in those he was encouraging because they didn't have their best life. And what he was saying, you have no idea how important your role is. God is doing something through you that if you understood the scope of it, it would take your breath away. Paul understood that what was happening in and through him was planned from the foundation of the world. Look what it says in Isaiah. And this is the last verse we'll look at. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Describing the children of Abraham as those to and through whom God would introduce himself to the world. Look what it goes. But I said, I've labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord. My God has been my strength. Here's what it's saying. As the Israelites at the time of Isaiah, they, <laughs> things were a mess. And it didn't seem like anything good was going to happen. We're not going to be your spokespersons to anyone. 
we've been in captivity to here and, and we're going into captivity there and we don't feel like we are able to represent anything good. And here's what Isaiah says to them, not only, well, look what it says. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations. You understand what Isaiah is saying? What he's saying to these individuals who thinks that they have been set aside? He goes, you know what? It's too small a thing that I'm going to call some of you to illumine just this group of people. I am going to cause you to illumine the whole world. Not only are you my spokesperson to Israel, you are going to be from Israel, spokespersons to the world. And, and then he goes on, I will make you as a light for the nations. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. Will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. So he's saying, what, Mike, what's, what is he saying? Um, well, Paul understood that prediction was being fulfilled through him and the Jewish Christians that had been dispatched into the Roman Empire. What he's telling them, hey, I want you to imagine you're the Jewish Christians dispersed into the, into the Roman Empire, saying, hey, you know that thing about Isaiah? You know, remember when it said, in the day of salvation, in the acceptable time? Do you remember that? That's what's happening now. That's what, that's what he has encouraged them. Hang in there. Hang in there. Um, what does this mean to us? How does it apply to us? We can see them, and he, Paul encouraged them, and uh, God cared enough for us that he would send people so that we could receive the good news. How do we, how do we take this in? Um, in this season, remember what happened at the cross. Jesus became sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, be clear, Jesus, as our substitute, uh, no, I don't think that's what Paul says here. Representative, as sin's representative. You know what he wants you to believe? That even though you violated the commandments, if you believe in Christ, what's happened to Christ happened to you. Jesus was raised from the dead. If you place your faith in Christ, you should have listened to me. You're still going to be alive a hundred years from now. Jesus rose from the dead bodily. And he wasn't kidding. There's eternal existence. Those who are going to be included are those who base their faith in what God did for them in sending his son, not what they did to and to and not for him. Continue to grasp and put your faith in what Christ did. And what you're going to find hundred years from now, I'm going to talk to you and say, remember when we were on earth and it wasn't all that hot sometimes, was it? You're going to say, no, Mike, it wasn't. We didn't have it as bad as they did, but it really wasn't. How about now? Any stress or agitation now? I was talking to a bunch of people. We were talking to some the other day and was talking about believing in Christ. You have to hold tension on this side of the, the grave, right? I mean, holding tension. That time I'm going to ask, hey, any tension, Brett? Any tension at that time? Dennis, Andrea, Donna, I could go. Any tension if I, if you're through faith in Christ? Craig? Any tension, Nancy, Dave, Arden, Tom, Kim, Chuck? Don, Wanda, any tension 100 years from now? No, this is what I was made for. I'm finally home. This is what I always wanted. I didn't know I wanted him. Um, continue to believe the message of reconciliation and help people to understand that this is the message of the cross. Brett, come on up. We're going to sing a closing song. We pray for us. God, thanks for 
the message of the cross, the message of reconciliation. It's something that we understand more deeply as time goes on. We remain in it. We continue to listen to it and continue to listen to it and continue to listen to it. And it kind of sinks down a little bit deeper and deeper and deeper, little by little, progressively changing the way we think and feel about ourselves and you and others. Continue to transform us by this message so that we could both understand it and reflect it to others. In Jesus' name, amen.